Hey guys, it's Annalise. I just want to say a massive thank you for tuning in to Seriously in 2023. You've all been amazing listeners and I'm very, very grateful for the response. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year's from Annalise and Producer Tim. Welcome to the Seriously Podcast. I'm your host, Annalise Gann. Now let's get into it. Welcome to the Seriously Podcast, where we make light of serious conversations with really interesting people. In 2012, aged 18 years old, Liz Parnov became the youngest competitor in Olympic history to contest the women's pole vault. Almost one decade on, Liz now boasts an even more impressive resume, which includes being a two times Olympian after she was selected to compete in Tokyo in 2020. Since reaching peak stardom as an athlete, Liz has also gone on to win Australian Survivor in 2023, model with one of Australia's biggest agencies and date an icon in the fashion industry, Daniel Bradshaw, owner of Street X. Liz has done a lot and I can't wait for you to all hear of what she has to say on this Seriously chat. Here she is. Liz, welcome to Seriously. Hello, good morning. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm good. We met a few weeks ago and when we met, you were like, I'm a self-confessed introvert. Yeah, I am. Which is amazing because like you've been on TV, like Mm. you've done so much. You're like a world famous athlete. Yeah, I don't know. I like, I feel like in like the sporting world, I'm extroverted and then socially I'm an introvert. It's really weird. But like, I don't know. I feel like I just get like really shy. Like I went to the event on my own because I'm like really trying to force myself to get out there and engage more in like social media world. I hate saying that, but like, you know what I mean? Like I know to events and stuff. Mm -hmm. And like, I never, ever, ever used to do that because I'd be so nervous that like I wouldn't know anyone and I'd be awkwardly standing there on my own. But I feel like I've done it a few times now and I'm like, okay. I was just so happy to see you there because I feel like that's the first event I've met you at. Yeah, well, it was the first one I went to properly. Okay, cool. <laughs> that makes <laughs> sense. But I just want to ask you a few questions, obviously. Mm-hmm. You've achieved so much in your life, but I want to start from the beginning yeah. when you moved to Australia, mm-hmm. when you were two from Moscow in Russia. Yeah. What was that like? Um, I don't remember because I was a baby, but um, – I mean, my parents moved to Australia for a better life to give their kids more opportunities. Obviously, at the time in Russia, it was a bit rough. Um, So, yeah, my mum and dad just moved here. It was either Australia, New Zealand or America. Mm. And dad had gone and, like, sussed the three. And he got offered a job in Australia. So he was like, yep, we'll take it. So we moved. They didn't know any English. And they just pretty much figured it out on the fly. And, yeah, it was the best thing they ever did for us. Did you move to Perth? So we moved to Adelaide for three years Mm -hmm. and then we relocated to WA and I've never left since. Wow. Yeah. And so you were talking to me before, you speak Russian. Yeah. So is that your native tongue and then English or what would you say? Mm, Oh, I mean like I'm definitely English speaking first I'd say. Mm -hmm. But I like when when I hear Russian I understand it better than I can say it. Like I struggle to find the right words, whether it's like past or present tense. Mm -hmm. You know how we have that in Australian, like in English as well? Yes. Like they, them, all of that, like they're, they're, whatever. Yeah. Um, And obviously being removed from people that constantly speak Russian around me, I'm lazy. So I don't practice it. I don't speak it. Um, So having my parents around, they're here at the moment visiting from Russia for Christmas. Oh, beautiful. It's really nice because I'm like, yep, I'm forcing myself to speak Russian. I'm going to just like retrain my brain and then, yeah. So they speak Russian with you only? Pretty much, yeah. That's amazing. And they like, they have really broken English. So Oh, I love that. Same, I love it too. Like I feel like I used to be hell embarrassed when I was a kid, but I love it now so much that they've like kept that and... Yeah, they speak Russian to me and I'll just reply like whatever comes first, whether it's like English, Russian, a mix. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rushlish. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) That's so cool. And speaking of your family, Mm -hmm. a lot of people in your family are professional athletes. Mm. Can you tell me a bit about that? Like did you ever feel like you were destined to always be an athlete yourself? 
Did you feel like you got a lot of say or was it just like we're all athletes? Yeah, I, I like I feel like it was just the environment that I was kind of like brewed in in a way. Like it was just what everyone did, everyone trained, everyone went down to the track. Like that's how I essentially got into it is because my dad was a coach and my mum would just take us down in the pram We'd walk around, we'd play in the sand pit. So it was just like it very organically just kind of happened and then it got to the point where we would be like, oh, like what's dad doing over there? Like let's go join in. And so then we'd join in and then we'd slowly pick up the pole and like start doing exercises. And I think it was just we were – what's that saying where it's like you are a result of like your environment kind of thing? Mm-hmm. Like it was just really natural. Mm-hmm. And you're a pole vaulter. Yeah. Well, you've recently retired. Yes, ex pole vaulter. So, why did you choose pole vaulting? And was there any other athletics that you liked, but mm. you weren't necessarily the best at? Or was like that, were you just like, I always wanted to be a pole vaulter? I think pole vaulting chose me, like as corny as it sounds. It was really the only thing I ever did in athletics. Mm -hmm. I remember at school I played – I remember in year seven I was on the inter-school sports carnival football team and I was the ruck and I loved playing football and I loved playing netball. Mm -hmm. But then once I started playing netball a bit more, I'd like jar my fingers or my ankles and dad was just like, no, like if you're doing pole vault, like you can't be injured doing stuff like that. So then I had to like essentially decide Mm -hmm. if I was going to keep pole vaulting or not and of course I did. Mm. And you've done so well. So can you tell the people what you've won, where you've been Um, with pole vaulting? Yeah, so I guess I kind of hit like a professional level when I was about 15. I went to my first Commonwealth Games in New Delhi when I was 15 and that was – shock to the system I feel like everything between like 15 and 20 for me was just like how is this happening like it was just happening like and I didn't really like ever plan or expect to be as good as I was Mm -hmm. um I went to multiple youth wait what what did I even do I went to world juniors multiple times world youth championships I went to the youth olympics I actually got silver in all of them I never got a gold oh wow that's amazing though I know but like Yep. Pissed. Yeah. Um, and then I, as an adult, as like a senior, I went to three Commonwealth Games wow. and two Olympics. Wow. Yeah. Can I ask from like a personal point of view, mm-hmm. what was going to the Olympics like and like what was the villages like? I've just always wanted to know. Yeah. So I went to London in 2012 and then I had Tokyo which was a COVID game. So the experience was extremely different. Okay. Uh, London, I was 18. So I was just like, oh my God, like what is happening? It was just an out of body experience. Um, Extremely overwhelming, like didn't plan on qualifying. It just happened. It was just like a whirlwind year, Mm -hmm. but unreal. Like some of the best memories of my life, just rubbing shoulders with all those incredible athletes and like, that's where you want to be as like a young athlete and so being there and like being in that environment, it's just insane. And then Tokyo was really crap. Like Mm. it was very underwhelming. Like the village wasn't half finished. Mm. We couldn't go anywhere. We couldn't do anything. We literally had to eat at the dining hall, sit in our room, go to Mm. training, sit in our room. Like there was nothing. So for me... I feel like an Olympics is like a full package experience. Like, yes, you're there to compete, but it's also like a celebration of the games and like everyone coming together and like the city that you're in comes alive and it's like this whole like festival kind of thing. So Tokyo didn't have that and it was just a bit like flat. Mm -hmm. That's interesting that you say that because I've seen the Olympics obviously on TV, never been, and I'm obviously not an athlete, Um, but every time I've watched it, I'm always interested to know the opening ceremony is such a vibe. Mm -hmm. It's so vibey. It's so much energy. How much time then do you have before your events and how do you come down from that nice and slow without like burning out? Yeah. So I actually never did an opening ceremony for that reason because – it's usually athletics is at the start I'm pretty sure so it's like a two-week 
kind of Olympic Games period Mm -hmm. and they kind of split up what events are on at what time. And so I always found that for me personally, I preferred not to go to the opening ceremony because I think it was just too overwhelming, like too Mm. many emotions. You're just like, oh, my God, this is it. Like I've made it, blah, blah, blah. And I think you can feel quite burnt out after. Mm. I mean, everyone's different. Some people can go and use it as like motivation and fire, but I never did an opening ceremony for that reason. I just tried to like lay low and chill. And then I did the closing ceremony, which was just like a big party and fun and like. Yeah, just like everyone. loose. Yeah, getting loose, having a few drinks. Mm -hmm. Can you take me through your race day routine? Like Mm. what – did you have any like specific things that you're superstitious about or you're just like I have to eat this, I have to do this, I have to tie my shoes like this? Like what was your routine? Yeah, I I think when I was younger I was like super anal and like I have to do it like this or I will like Mm -hmm. not jump. And then as I got older I was just like, you know what, like if I'm going to wear two left socks, I'll wear two left socks. Like it's not about that. Like it's – that's just like insane that you're like putting so much pressure on something that's so insignificant when at the Mm -hmm. end of the day like you're going there to move your body and do things you do every single day – Mm. That like adding that extra pressure because of something you didn't eat, I think is just absurd. Mm -hmm. But I would always have like the night before like a massive, massive dinner because when I'm really nervous, I just like churn through calories. Like Mm -hmm. I have a very fast metabolism and I'd always struggle to maintain weight. Oh, really? Yeah. So when I'm like stressed, I'm not like a stress eater. I'm like the opposite. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd eat a lot. Like pasta? Yes, like pasta Mm -hmm. steak, like as much as I can, dessert. Mm -hmm. Then in the morning, depending on where I was, if I was in at home in Australia, I'd like to get up, go down to the beach in the morning, have a swim, get a coffee, come home, make like a big breakfast, then um, like watch some Netflix, read a book, scroll on my phone. Um, do some like journaling, read through like any notes that I had of things that I was going to focus on in that competition. Wow. And then really just like switch off and just chill and just try to have it be a normal day. Like. Wow. Get my nails done or just like, I don't know, like just, yeah. Like, okay. So not focus all your energy on the event. It's like a normal day and then I'm just jumping. Exactly. Because Mm -hmm. my mindset was always like. There was this really great saying that my psych taught me and I can't remember it now but it was like a competition day is just like another training day. Like there's mm. really no difference. Mm-hmm. Like and you shouldn't act differently. Mm. Like because when you're in that setting and you're in that environment, the emotions and the adrenaline of the occasion will help you rise to where you need to be so you don't have to force it. Does that make sense? And is that why some people like – because I <laughs> – I'm just going to laugh at myself now. I used to do very low level <laughs> competing in surf lifesaving. Yes. But, but then, yeah, when I was a kid I did like paddling and like mm-hmm. Iron Woman. But the thing is I would get so nervous on the day because I put so much emphasis and then I wouldn't perform that well. Mm-hmm. So is that why? Yeah, like, I think so. Because you, you just build it up and then you're like yeah. I'm not going to do it. You just make like a mountain out of a molehill. Like it's just not necessary. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's what worked for me and everyone's different. But That's super interesting. Can I ask in the villages, do you guys share a room or do you have your own room? Or like does it depend on the level of the athlete? Like if it's their first one, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it usually it's like an apartment situation. Oh, cool. So it's like an apartment and there's like three or four bedrooms and you're usually sharing with one person. Mm -hmm. And then obviously if you're like a gold medal hope or like, you know, your top three, Mm -hmm. you will probably have your own room because they want you to like make sure that you're like in the zone. Like Usain Bolt? Yes. He would have his own room. He would have his own room. He Mm -hmm. wouldn't have anyone bother him. Like Mm -hmm. it would just be his little bubble. Yep. Um, But yeah, apartments and you share. Who was your roomie? Oh, God. Okay, first games, my roomie was – this is going back a good 11 years. Oh, sorry. (laughs) I don't even know what I – don't ask me. It's Saturday morning. I don't even know what I had for dinner last night. I can't remember (laughs) – stop. No. I think I was put with like an older athlete because I was so young and they wanted someone just to like – Okay, that's cool. Kind of mentor me almost. And then in Tokyo I was rooming with one of my like athletic besties, Morgan Mitchell. 
who's a runner. Oh, I know her. Yeah, she's so fun. So we room together in Tokyo. Is there anyone you're still really close with? Like, are you still friends with Morgan? Yeah, like, I mean, it's hard because, like, everyone's on the East Coast. Yep. And I'm over here. So it's pretty much social media and just, like, staying in touch. And then if I'm over East and I have time, I'll, like, reach out to catch up. But I guess it's just, like, Instagram friends, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Like acquaintances. Yeah. Hey guys, if you've loved listening to the Seriously podcast, we'd really appreciate a five-star review on Apple or Spotify podcasts. It keeps us making incredible content for all of you to hear. Thanks so much. Can you talk me about the decision for leaving Mm -hmm. athletics? Like how did that decision come to be and like how hard was that? Because that was your whole life. Yeah. So I finished Tokyo Games and I performed really badly And I left and I came home and I was just like, nah, like I had this fire in my belly. I was like, one more. Like I want to just do one more. I want to do Paris. I want to like just prove myself because I felt like I had like a lot left to prove. And then it was a few months back and I just was so unmotivated. I was exhausted. I was having like the yips at training. So it was just like I was fearing pole vault. I didn't have confidence. Um, I didn't want to go to training. It was just all these like insane feelings I'd never felt before. And I was just like, what is going on? Like, why am I feeling like this? Like, this is not who I am. Like, pole vault is my life. I should love it and I should want to do it. So I went and saw a therapist and I was just like, help me. Like, what's wrong with me? And it pretty much all just came down to like my identity. Like, Mm. I pretty much had like an identity crisis. I put so much emphasis on being a pole vaulter and like, that's who I am, that's how people know me and without that I'm nothing. Mm. So there was like a lot of baggage there to unpack and essentially I think I just burnt out. Like I just lost that passion. I didn't want to sacrifice every single day. I didn't want to miss out on things anymore. You know, I was 27 turning 28 at the time and so I was like, you know, I've only – in my mind I want to have kids Mm. like early 30s so I was like – I've got a couple of years to fit everything in that I've always wanted to do that I haven't been able to do. Like take a holiday and travel and I don't know, like eat whatever I want, like just like the little things. So it took me about six months to come to the decision because it wasn't something I wanted to – you know how athletes say they retire and then a month later they're like, I'm back. And then they just like keep going back and forth. I was like, I don't want that. Like I just want a clean cut. And so it took me a while and then once – I was on when I was on Survivor actually I had a lot of time to myself to just like reflect and be with my thoughts and I just thought no nah, like there's more to life now like I want to try other things and I feel so blessed that I had like 15 years of this incredible life and essentially now I get to start a whole new life mm. so like yeah thank you for being so honest because I feel like a lot of people can relate like mm. your job becomes your identity Yes. Do you know what I mean? And then without it, you're like, who am I? But that that little block, like that window of that shift is really hard mm-hmm. and then coming out the other end is beautiful and you're yeah. reborn. And when you come out of it, you're like, what was I thinking? Yeah. Like I have so much like more to I'm give. I'm more than my job. Yes. <laughs> like, yes. But it's hard when – because I did modelling for 10 years. Mm-hmm. I still do but like I so get it. I did it from when I'm young and like without, you know, an agency or something, I was like, who am I? Yeah. Sounds stupid. <laughs> yeah, it sounds silly it's now. It's true. But it's interesting. Yeah, it's it's crazy and I feel like we need to talk about it more and there's like no mm. shame in like having those thoughts and feelings because like you said, I feel like a lot of people can relate. Yeah. When you're stuck doing something for so long. At a high level. Yes. And it's yep. like I literally was thinking like, oh, my God, will my parents love me? Will Daniel still want to be my boyfriend? Like <laughs> yeah. insane, insane things. Insane thoughts. Yes. But it's like I had them. A hundred percent. Now, people listening might know you from Survivor Mm. and you are the winner of Australian Survivor Season 8. How did the show come to be? Did they approach you? Tell me everything. So I had always watched Survivor as a young girl and I love obstacles. I love like 
relay races. Like I just love like – I'm obviously quite competitive. And so I'd watched it my whole childhood. And then when I had my break from pole vault to decide what I wanted to do, I thought, right, I've got time. I can disappear for six, eight weeks. I don't have to be at training. Like this is my time to just go and try something new and see how I feel. Did you apply or did they approach you? No. So they'd approached me in the past – Mm -hmm. and obviously, like, I had sport, like, I couldn't put that on hold. Mm. So I contacted my agency at the time, and I said, hey, I really want to do this. Can you just make some calls and see? And they were like, yep, no worries. Vivians? Yeah. Yeah. And so it literally happened in the space of two weeks. They had one spot left. It was a villain. I managed to fit the criteria. (laughs) I'd already had, like, a girl's – my first ever girl's holiday booked for Europe – and I was like, oh, God. So I still went. I went for 10 days, cut it short, flew straight from London to Samoa to film the show. So it was a very, like, whirlwind few weeks. But I just thought, screw it. Like, my whole life is routine, regiment, structure. Like, I'm just going to do something crazy. Wow. Yeah. So did you have any inkling that you were going to win? God, no. Absolutely really? not. Like, for those people that know me, like, I don't camp. I like hotels and nice things and (laughs) shower two times a day, moisturise two times. Like I'm like very in touch with my feminine like hygiene side Mm -hmm. and it was a brutal shock. Like I never, ever, ever thought I could get as far as I did. Um, It's extremely glamorised on TV. It is. That's what I want to know. Like the gritty details like – Watching it, I'm like, like before I went on, I was like, oh, I can easily do this. Like how hard can it be? Like it's so chill. And then you get there and they drop you and that is it. Like they genuinely drop you. You try to talk to the producers. They pretend they're not there. Like they don't reply to you. They don't respond. Like it is insane. And so I think my whole – I was just in like fight or flight for like a good week because I was like, can I swear? Go for it. I was just like, what the fuck am I doing here? Like, I want to go home. Like, (laughs) I'm not built for this. And I think, like, it's a pretty amazing experience when you're, like, with a group of random people you've never met and you're all just suffering together. Like, it actually brings you really close Mm. and you form these really hectic bonds really fast because think, like, when are you ever with someone 24-7? Like, even with your partner, you're not together all day. Mm Mm-mm. So it's like it's insane. You're with these people all day, all night. Mm. You don't get away from them. Mm-hmm. So it's a wild, wild experience. Did you get fed? No. Did you have to like – I begged. Really? I begged for food. I cried. I said I want to go home, feed me or I'm done. And they were like, no. Because you know what? I didn't watch it but I watched the episode where you won. Yeah. Your challenge was grueling. Can mm. you talk to us about that challenge? Yeah, so that you actually won. Mm, it was incredible. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It was the final challenge, and we were on a, like a cliff face in Samoa, and it was breathtakingly stunning, like molten rock, like so aesthetically beautiful. And we were placed on like a crucifix type. Wooden. It was some Jesus thing. Like yeah. it was like yeah. We were stood on a tiny little wooden block where we had to either have our toes or heels on at all time. You couldn't take a foot off and you couldn't take your hands off the cross. And as time progressed, Jonathan, the host, would wind this lever that would push out these four spikes into your back. So by the end, when it was fully extended, I was like a full contortionist, like dislocating my shoulders. Um, And we were up there. I, I was up there for over four hours. And I just don't know how. Like it's... Like, I would never do that. Like, I can't even go to Pilates and not stop. Like, I am a quitter with, like, a lot of things like that. I'm just like, you know what? This hurts. I'm done. Like, why am I going to push myself? What came over you? I don't know. I genuinely don't know. Like, do you think it was a higher power? Or do you think it's, like, years of – because I saw that and I was like, she's an athlete. Do you know what I mean? Then I looked you up and I was like, okay, she's, like, a world athlete. Like, it makes sense. I, yeah, I genuinely think it's like the 15 years I had of like discipline, mind training, everything through sport mm. that just kind of translated into Survivor without me even knowing. Mm. And I think it 
makes me feel as though my whole life and my whole career, I didn't give myself enough credit for what I could do. Mm. And then when I'm in that survivor environment, I think it's the competitive side Mm. really comes out, the ego, Mm -hmm. because in my mind, I'm like, I'm an Olympian. I'm not going to get, let this bloke beat me. I love that. And so it's just like those weird little things that fuel you. It's, yeah, it's so wild. So it's almost like that 15 years came down to that one moment. Literally. And I said this to my parents after because they were like, obviously when you're there you don't have any contact with anyone. Mm. And when I got off and I called them, they were like, what the fuck? What is going on? Are you okay? We thought you died, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I think I won. And they were like are you joking? And I was like, no, like I actually think I won. And we were all just crying and I was just saying to them, I was like, I genuinely think that like Survivor was my moment and like Mm. my whole athletics career taught me and trained me for that moment. It's wild. It's so insane. And you've said yourself it was a life-changing moment. Like it changed your whole life because you won a big sum of money. Mm Mm-hmm. Congratulations. Thank you. Has that like changed your life? Look, to be fair, like the money's great. It definitely takes like a level of financial stress. Mm-hmm. It's not enough to honest, honest, like just to like put my feet up and chill. Mm-hmm. But I think above the money and everything else, it's what I learned about myself. That is the best thing that I've come away with is mm. I'm capable of so much more than I think I can do I can push my mind and body further than I thought I could Mm. and it just gives me this like confidence that I didn't have and like Mm. yeah like I don't know I think I always just undersold myself for what I could do and now I'm actually like well no like I have one survivor and like I did all these things I would never do so interesting because when I met you as well I was like you're so down to earth I'm like, just like a chill Aussie bogan chick. Yeah, you're so down to earth. And I, I came home to my partner and I was like, this is so nice. Like I really Thanks. vibed with you and I feel like a lot of people in this industry are very up themselves and you, you kind of meet them and you're like, whoa. Yes. <laughs> you, I was just like so happy that you were so nice. Oh, thank you. That's, a, that's the biggest compliment because – that's the one thing I always just – I just want to be me. I don't want to change who I am, for who I'm with or what I'm doing. And that was like the one thing on Survivor. I was like, I'm just going to be me no matter how far it gets me. And like the best feedback I ever got was when all my friends and family were watching and they were like, oh, my God, this is just you to the T. Like the facial expressions, the chat back, like all of it. It's just exactly you. And I was like, thank God, because that's like my biggest thing. Because I hate when you watch people and you're like, you're actually not like that. Like why are you being a dick? Yeah. Yeah, you're just like what you see is what you get. I feel like I'm the same. Yeah, you are. I don't <laughs> I don't know how to act. That's why I've never done freaking yeah. acting. I'm shit at acting, um, as everyone tells me. Thanks, guys. Um, can we talk about the fame element? Like you came off Survivor. How has it been like transitioning? Obviously you got a lot of media attention mm. in your athletics career, but like reality TV is another ball game, especially Survivor. Has that changed for you? Um, I don't think so. I don't know. I just feel like... I'm just the same. Like I do the same things. Do you get recognised? Yeah, I do. But only I'm realising now that I'm going to all these events Mm. and I'm going there and I'm like, no one knows me. And then they're all like, Liz, 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 oh my God, well done. And I'm like, oh shit, you guys watched. Like I feel like I'm so desensitized, like I'm just so removed from that world that like I don't actually know that people know me. Interesting. So I'm just like chilling at home, like whatever, like, just going to my local shopping. Like I'm just so normal and like not about that, that when I go to these events and I've got people talking to me the whole night, I'm like, oh, God, people actually know me. Like I need to like – No, yeah. but I, I think that's refreshing. Yeah. I like it. I I really like your vibe. Thank you. Now you're dating fashion icon <laughs> Daniel Bradshaw, owner of Street X. Mm-hmm. Can you tell me about that? How did you guys meet? Yes, so we met almost six years ago. Oh, really? In a couple of weeks. It's gone very quick. Um, He was in my DMs for a very long time. (laughs) Modern day romance, guys. (laughs) And I would just – I was like a serial dater when I was younger. Like I was just never single. 
And so, like, I'd always be with a guy and I'd just, like, reply or, like, leave him on scene or, like, reply a month later and just be like, oh, so sorry, I missed your message, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and then he would, like, keep pushing and I'd keep pushing back and then I, I really – I was loving what Street X was doing at the time and so I messaged him and I was like, hey, can I have a job? I'm looking for something casual, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, only if you give me your number. <laughs> and I was like, nah, I'm good. And so I left it. And then <laughs> we were at Pineapple Club of all places mm-hmm. and I was there with a group of girlfriends and they were all leaving and I didn't want to go home yet. And they were like, oh, come meet Daniel. Like you will get along with him so well. They were mutual friends. And I was like, oh, my God, it's this guy. Like I can't. He's obsessed with me. I don't want to see. <laughs> yeah, and he was yeah. wearing a Brisbane Lions footy players kit, like singlet and shorts. He's very eccentric. He's very out I there. Love. And I was just like. Like, who is this cat? Like, I'm not sure this is my vibe. And then we intru- got introduced and that was it. We Just hit it off. Hit it off. He's the most amazing person. And, yeah, like, we literally are just, like, made for one another. Wow. So you've been yeah. dating for six years. Yeah. Wow. Do you guys want to get married? Yes. And babies? Yeah. <gasps> oh, my God. Hopefully soon. I mean, yeah. I'm 30 next year, so I feel like I'm, like, r- getting ready. Mm-hmm. Getting ready for that. I still want to have a little bit of fun end of like this year. Maybe take one more Europe trip and then I'd like to settle down. So we'll see. That's exciting. So you do want like the white picket fence? Yeah. Like I came from like a very family family and like my family's my life. Mm. My sister has kids and I'm just obsessed with them. So like I definitely want that for us and I think Daniel would be the most amazing father. Mm. So yeah, I would love, love, love. To have that one day. Oh, my God. And I could imagine your baby in Street X. Oh, I know. Wait, is there a kid's line yet? There's not. Is no, there. but there will be. Yeah. If oh my I God. have any say. It, the little shoes and the little... Just like oh, baggy pants and track suits. <laughs> but, yeah, you're both very successful. And to me, you kind of remind me of the Beckhams of Australia. Oh, stop it. No, seriously. Like, I just love you guys together. You're both so successful in your own right. And then it's Thank like a power you. couple. Does yeah. that relationship garner a lot of attention? Um, I don't know. I just don't really look at it. Like I don't – I, I don't know. That. Like I'm just in my bubble. Yeah. Like I don't really listen to anything or read anything. Like we've had a few Perth Now articles which is just like surely you've got better shit to be reporting on. Like A few. There's like a hundred. <laughs> yeah, but like we're literally just like a – standard couple like it's just Just not newsworthy I think it's ridiculous Mm -hmm. but I do feel like us both having our own like strong passions and desires and like work ethic to our dreams makes us work better because it's like we both understand each other's sacrifice and like I know when he's working late I would be doing the exact same thing do you know what I mean so it's like we just get each other that's what you need I feel like when you're both successful it just works yeah. It balances. Like you, you can't just have get it. There's no jealousy. There's no like spend more time with me. It's like, well, no, because if I was I'm working busy. late mm. and he asked me to come home, I'd be like, fuck off. Like I'm doing stuff. Is his hours very like, because he's in Bali right now. Yeah. His hours are just like 24-7. All over the place. Seven, yeah. yeah. Being a business owner. Yeah. Liz, you've been an amazing guest. I want to end this pod on one last question. Mm-hmm. If you could give a piece of advice to your younger self, what would it be? It would be to have some better self-belief. I think I was always so critical of myself when I was young and I never felt like I was doing good enough Mm. in terms of my sport. So if I was to look back now, I would just say to be kinder to yourself and give yourself more praise Mm. and I'm such a firm believer seeing at how my life has panned out now that everything happens for a reason just like keep doing the right things day in day out keep putting in the one percenters and no matter which way your path goes that's how it's meant to be and I feel like yeah I'm a bit like superstitious like that so am I I love that. Yeah. It, I I believe in destiny like yes. that. Yes. Like you can try so hard to yes. do one thing but th- the universe is like whack. Yeah, like <laughs> go, go that down way. and you're like, no, I'm not meant to go that way. I'm meant to go that way. But then you go that way and then something incredible happens and you're like, wow, mm-hmm. had I have not gone that way, I would have never have got there. Mm. Well, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on Seriously. Where can people find you? I am on Instagram 
at Liz Panov and I'm trying to grow my TikTok, but far out, man. That platform is just next level. I can't keep up. It is. We should make a TikTok. We should. <laughs> but I'm like, TikTok is so oversaturated. Is it? Yeah. It's just mm-hmm. like the same. Mm-hmm. That's a whole other conversation. But anyway, I'm on TikTok at Liz Panov as well. So you can go check it out. Amazing. Thank you so much for coming Thank on the Thank you pod. for having me. Thanks. Thanks, guys, for listening. It's been an amazing interview and I'll catch you next week for another guest. Bye.